give some props to the conference organizers. Um, it's always a lot of work to put together these events and to bring a community together. So um, thank you for having me. And um, it's always great for me to come and meet other people in the field. Um, I feel like it's a privilege for me every single time I get to do this. And I've done this quite a few times now. So I'm really stoked to be here. So in the last, uh, I would say, five or six years, I've been working a lot on emergent tech. And uh, I worked on a bunch of machine learning products. Um, and I think that experience of designing experiments for um, emergent tech has really changed how I thought about design and how it changed how I thought about problem solving also. So I, I'm here to kind of share my work with you. So uh, thanks to Dave who already introduced some of this and, th and stole my thunder. Um, but. <laughs> But basically, uh, in, the, in the movie The Wizard of Oz, what happens is that um, Dorothy and the gang go to see the wizard. And when they go to see the wizard, he appears to them as this floating head with fire and smoke, right? And the, and the, the phrase Wizard of Oz prototyping actually got you know, uh, its name from this. So when Dorothy and the gang discover that the Wizard of Oz is actually just this old man behind the curtain, who's like pulling levers and everything, um, they realize that the wizard is not real, right? It just, it just feels real. It feels like magic just for a moment, right? Um, so that's what Wizard of Oz prototyping is about, is to suspend someone's belief and make them feel like it's real, like the experience they're experiencing is real. So I saw this on Twitter probably last week. It wasn't in my deck, but I decided to put it in, right? Um, so the spirit of it is like Wizard of Oz. Wizard of Oz prototypes are hacks that are done really, really fast. But the reason why this isn't a Wizard of Oz prototype is because uh, we already have a mental model of how air-conditioned experiences inside cars work. So when we look at this, we say, that's just a hack, right? So let's revisit what prototypes really mean and why we prototype. Um, I think we prototype because we want to connect our intuition to problem solving. Um, we prototype so that we can ask better questions. We prototype so that we can experience something that is invisible. So for example, when we're trying to understand how a transition work, or an animation, or something ephemeral that we can't understand, just the flatness of it on paper. Um, on our team, engineers also prototype so that they can understand the constraints of a technology, right? The first time I worked on search, I understood that um, the key to really understanding the granularity of how we search um, relies on the fact that the engineers have to understand the data. So I forced them to prototype a very ugly prototype um, just so they can see the data. But I actually think what prototyping means is that we prototype so that we can actively think, right? Um, it's not that we're trying to make the solution look exactly and work exactly the way it is. There's, there's a whole continuum of, of prototyping. And uh, when we prototype, we can understand better the questions we're asking about capability, about how something feels, about transitions, all of these things that makes the product better. We can identify what is it that we don't know we don't know. Uh, this is a quote from my previous product manager in a two years or three years ago when I was still a UX designer, um, and I live by this. He said that good design isn't about the quality of the idea. Good design is about the quality of good thinking. And I hope to illustrate that today throughout this presentation. So I said before that prototyping is a way to ask better questions. A lot of times when we conceptualize something, uh, we have to ask a question like, how would do we know that this is true? Right? So engineers will ask questions about capability, designers will ask questions about behavior, and there might be compounded assumptions in there. So prototyping for me is a way to isolate the key questions and ask better questions. Um, probably the most important thing about Wizard of Oz prototyping is a way to imagine the unimaginable. So if you look at the Wizard of Oz movie, right, nobody could imagine that the Wizard of Oz was like that. They, could, they, they didn't know what, how it would feel. They had no expectations, right? So uh, when you use Wizard of, Wizard of Oz prototyping when 
you can't use the original regular tools that you would have. You just have to like build something that you cannot otherwise have built just with your regular tools. This is the early iPhone UI prototyping. And I want to point out that it was real, it's really, really ugly, right? Because the point of this is just to get to a conceptual model. The point of this was to get to a perfect UI. Um, and the other thing that's important about this is that they did two prototypes. One with the early scroll wheel iPod prototype, and then the other one with the early concept of the early iOS prototype. So the iPod prototype was done because at the time, the iPod was the, uh, the reigning product for Apple. It was a conceptual model that they know users are already using, right? So that, that's probably the baseline for the experiment, to test it against a baseline. But uh, at this point, you know, there's no bells and whistles. It's just a very basic navigation. You can feel and play with it. Today, I'm going to tell you three stories. Uh, and it's all um, work that I've done. Um, about two and a half years ago, I left GoPro and I went to work for a startup, mainly because I was ready to leave GoPro, and then the other reason is because all my friends left GoPro and went here. Um, so uh, what this company is is that uh, they, they, they were trying to build uh, IoT technology, so Internet of Things. And they bought this house, and um, the idea was that they were going to gut the house and then basically put a bunch of sensors in it and then build the experience inside the house. So they can just test things inside the house. Um, the, uh, the problem was that you know, we didn't know exactly what the product would be. It was like a think tank. It was like, let's build a bunch of experiments, and out of that, something will come, come up from all the experiments that we ran. And um, so when I came in, I was like, well, well what, what does the designer do? I mean, it's voice, you just tell the robot to do whatever, and it just does it, right? Um, so my product manager at the time says to me, uh, you're designing a butler without arms. So that was, that was basically the mission and the guiding principle. Um, so we thought about the house as a platform. Uh, and this is inside the house. We gutted the house, right? Um, at the time, Amazon had released its first version of the Echo, right? And there's all these isolated uh, Internet of Things devices. Um, but the, one of the terrible things about those devices, even now, is that they don't talk to each other. Like, you know, the hub works one way, and then if you want to turn on the light, you have to say, um, hey, Alexa, turn on you know, the, the lights. And Alexa doesn't understand. You say, hey, Alexa, turn on the kitchen lights, and so on and so forth. And if you sync the, uh, what is it, the hue bulb, sometimes it would drop off. So there's no connection about all these devices talking to each other. So we saw the house as a platform where things can plug into the house, and the house just knows. Um, the key thing is that it would be context and modality aware. So right now, uh, if you carry your phone around, the house doesn't know, inside your house, the house doesn't know where you are. That's why you have to say, turn on the kitchen lights and not just turn on the lights, right? Um, the other thing we were concerned about was uh, local first privacy, right? So, we were worried that um, users would be concerned that you know, we have, we're watching them all the time. So we had, a, uh, we had a, um, a guiding principle that we wouldn't put cameras inside the house. And uh, we'd be local first. You hear of mobile first, but we thought local first. Local first means that the house can operate without internet connection. Um, the other thing was that we wouldn't send the data to the cloud uh, live. Um, there were ways that we would hide the data, right? So these are some guiding principles that uh, we started with. Uh, the other idea is that we wanted the house to be aware. And the house just knows what your needs are and it's got your back. It, it's always like making sure you feel comfortable and safe. So one of the things that I grapple with when I start thinking about building an experience inside the house but I realized how much we got for free carrying around a mobile phone. When you carry around a mobile phone, you know where you are, you know what context. Uh, when the user takes the phone out and then clicks on the app, it already tells the app what, it, what, you know, what, the user already tells the app what the user wants, right? If you open like Uber, you already know you're going to ask for a ride. But when you're inside the house, you, you know, you don't know, right? Um, Modality is like uh, also like you're using touch. 
So that's a given. Uh, you don't know what your intent is. So all these things you're getting for free because the user came to the device and asked for something. And so the problem I had to solve was, how might we automate an event without explicit user input? How do I know what the user wants? Uh, so the first thing we have to do is we have to make sure that uh, the house can sense things. It knows where you are, you know, uh, it knows when there's a problem. Um, so the house is completely wired. Um, on, the, on this last picture over here, that's all sensors tied to uh, water pressure. So if you have a leak, the house knows. You, so you, it stops it before you even have to do anything. Uh, this is a picture of me just showing how much wires there are. And I actually had to go around the house kind of looking at where to place uh, tablets. I had built a house on my own, so I'm always stoked to take on another home improvement project. Um, this is really interesting. So these are sensors that we put into the floor. And the sensor don't know who you are, but the sensor know that you, human X, uh, uniquely are in this room, right? Um, so we put these sensors in the floor, and these are engineers who's testing the sensors. So the thing that people, you know, when people think about AI, they think like, oh, this is one consciousness that knows everything. But actually, it's a, it's a network of many AIs, right? And each AI has a job, and so, uh, it's only one job, right? So there's many different use cases inside the house. And so I always say that, you know, uh, each AI has only one job. And sometimes AI, when AI first, first gets started, it's really stupid. So it all just has one job. You got to do it right. Um, so when we were starting, we, we had to start from the beginning. Like, we had to ask ourselves, well, how do humans interact inside a space in a shared context um, in a uh, push interaction. So when you think about how you interact with devices now, it's always a pull interaction, right? You go to the device, you pull. Hey, system, I need this. Give it to me. Um, when you're in a place and the house is trying to get your attention, it's pushing something to you. If you think about interacting with human beings, like if I'm looking at Sean from across the room, I have to make eye contact with him first so he knows I'm looking at him, right? And then, and then we say something. So there's at least little nuances in behavior that we have to consider. And uh, we hack a lot of the experiments by using projection. So what we're looking on the floor over here is a projection on the floor. We use projectors, we use you know, cheap um, speakers, and then we just set things up. Uh, this is a... a um, prototype that we built to show like when someone comes to your door, uh, you can see who it is by the projection on the door. So. There is a solicitor at the front door. <laughs> so we had come from, all of us have come from computer vision, so we, you know, we use video a lot. Um, but we were using all these modalities in terms of how users might interact with the house. And the experiment I want to show you today is a basic experiment to see how users interact with technology in the space. So we looked at, we isolate each way of interacting uh, individually. First is tap, second one is touch, and the last one is talk. So this is touch. So before I play, I want to explain this a little bit. So it, there's always a, um, there's always a uh, voice component to it, because before you do something, the house has to let you know that it has something to say. Um, so we've looked at three different ways people interact. One is the way people interact today is they go to a light switch and they tap it. So our team built this uh, 3D printed, this basically this, this little button. And the button has lights, and then you can interact with just the button. Um, if you want more information, you have to open your phone. So, that's, so this is tap. There is someone in the driveway. Use the Home Lot app to watch the video. It says there's someone in the driveway. Use the Home app to look at the video. So basically, in order for you to extend the next, get the next piece of information, you need something else.
And this is a tablet. So the tablet works pretty much the way we use you know, tablets now, but it's more of a notification center. It's not like something you go and you play with apps and so on and so forth. And the last one is projection. This is a wall. Ava, what's wrong? I've discovered a leak in the water heater. Show me. Shut off the water. Okay. Everything is okay. So basically, the thing that we learned from those three things wasn't that any one was right. What we learned was the human behavior and, and how humans behave interacting with each of these things. We found out that continuity was really important because the first one, uh, which is the, uh, the button, uh, it was a loss of continuity. They have to pull out their phone. That was not good. Um, the second one, which is the tablet, the thing we discovered was that there are certain tasks that you're doing anyway, right? Like you're going to get when you have someone knocking on your door, you're going to the door anyway, but you might stop and then look at the tablet, right? Um, the third one is most interesting, which is the projection. So we found out that uh, people don't walk up to the projection because they can see it much further away. And so they are likely to just sit in the living room and then talk to the AI, right? Um, the other thing that people really like is that they like the fact that the Projection is invisible until you need it. But I think the most interesting thing of all is that it's about focus. So this is the floor plan of the house, and you see these little triangles up here. Um, that's, where the, we, that's where we position the projection. So if you have a projection and it's like basically projecting much further away, you're, you can stand much further away and interact with it. If you have uh, tablets in the blue triangles, you have to come up close to it and interact with it. Right? So to me, interaction is really about focus, getting your attention, and by the distance of your, of your attention, we can invite you to do different things. Uh, so yes, yeah, so I was talking about focus. So this is the second story. So this is actually, uh, I started this, I basically wrote the, uh, the abstract for this conference uh, with this case study in mind. So when I was at GoPro, I worked on the storytelling team, um, and uh, my, I was tasked with the job of helping users to tell their story quicker. So before I get into that, uh, let me explain this first. What happens when designers design is that usually they ask for constraints, right? But what happens if you don't know the constraints? What happens if you don't know what the capability is and you're trying to still figure out uh, what that cap capability should be? So for example, if you have a, a team of data scientists who's working on um, machine learning models, uh, normally what happens is that they would play and they come up with the machine learning models and then they would say, here's a recommendation engine designer, go and make it look pretty. Well, that's no fun, right? Um, so I wanna kinda talk about like, how can we as designers influence what data science and, and the AI team should do? So when, when, when engineering and data science approach AI or approach problems, what they're really doing is they're looking at things from a capability point of view. They're trying to figure out, like, how might this work? What is the true constraint? What can we build first? Oops, sorry. I'm too quick on the clicker. Okay, but when UX approach problem, the question they ask is, what is the human motivation? We're looking at it from a human lens. Crap. Okay, so let's get back to the GoPro problem. So at GoPro, uh, if you guys aren't aware of what GoPro does or what it is, is that GoPro makes action cameras. And um, the way people use them is that when they're out doing action sports, uh, they just wear the camera, and then they turn on the camera, and the camera just captures whatever, so that it doesn't miss any moment, right? 
the problem with this is that the camera over captures and you have like, you know, really shitty shots and you have like a few awesome moments. Uh, we call this set it and forget it. So the camera's basically you just turn it on and you forget about it, but the camera's going to capture everything. But people don't buy the camera to wear it. They buy it because they, it's, it's a promise of storytelling. They can tell a really awesome story from, from the videos they capture. So instead of uh, telling you, I'm going to show you. So these are my brother's footage. Uh, this is just one day over the course of a seven-day vacation. And I believe he shot over 30 gigabytes in total. So you can see here that he has a file here that is 12 minutes long. And here's another one that's 8 minutes long and another one that's 12 minutes long. So let's take a, take a look at this one. So there's a lot of shakiness at the start. And just uh, boring water, right? Nothing interesting. So I'll scrub forward. See if there's anything interesting. There's some interesting shots of Sydney swimming. And then I'll move forward a little bit. And right about here, uh, they're trying to coordinate to see how they're going to look in, in the shot. What are we doing? Smile. Huh? Hold on, don't turn on You're sick. Dad needs to be in the middle. Are you sure that's not how all selfies work? Because then Dad points more that way. She said, that's not how all selfies work. Yeah, so you can see that there's a lot of you know, bad shots, and it takes a while. You have to scrub through a lot of video to find the good moments, right? So how do we get users to go from that to this in five minutes? How do we get people to create videos like that with all the footage they capture in five minutes? And one of the things we understood is that uh, at GoPro, what users are aspire to do is to tell emotional stories from the moments that they experience, right? So then, at the time, GoPro purchased another company, and it's this company that does, you know, computer vision. That what they do is they build algorithms, algorithms to try to detect what the good shots are. And so from an engineering machine learning approach, um, what they do is they try to find, write algorithms to find, to detect the best moments without you having to do anything. So when you think about you and me looking through our video, we just know when we look at videos, uh, we just know that's a good shot, that's a good shot. I look ugly in that, but there's nothing interesting here. But when you kind of have to figure out like, well, what, how do I make the AI do that? There's many things you have to do to get the AI to recognize that. So each of these kind of slices in the sandwich is basically an, an algorithm. So the first thing you have to do is to, to eliminate what the bad parts are, right? So you can say, we're not going to look at these things. Um, and then, uh, so that's a non-highlight. That's not going to work, right? And then facial recognition. Facial recognition is when the algorithm uh, just recognizes a face. So our assumption is that if you focus on a face, usually that means it's something interesting. Um, audio, so audio uh, is really important. If you think about like people who go on bike trips or when they're like skiing, if they crash or something, they'll say, oh shit, right? And then that makes a really interesting story, right? So, um, so audio, what we do is we recognize the peaks in audio and we say that might be an interesting highlight in the story. Scene change, scene change is something like when you are jumping off of a cliff and then the background change. Um, telemetry, telemetry is like, uh, it basically detects um, speed, um, elevation. So if you're like skydiving, those kind of things, so it, all those data, points of data is captured. Um, and then each of these algorithms generate a graph. So where the peaks are, that's where the algorithm is saying there's probably a good, interesting moment there. So the algorithm is making guesses about what it thinks is an interesting point in the video. 
Um, so then what happens if you overlap all these algorithms together, and then you can say, okay, the general peak is here, you can say that that's, that's where you guessed that might be a good moment, right? So this is, the, this is what the uh, advanced tech team who, who works on the machine learning and computer vision did. Um, so the other important thing to, to point out is that um, for us, a highlight means that at that point in time, that frame in the, in the, uh, in the basically in a duration of a clip that, that we think is the most interesting part, right? So say, for example, if you jump off a cliff and you're in the middle of the leap or something, that's what we call a highlight. And then we take some time before and we take some time after and we say, that clip, five second clip, is an interesting highlight. The interesting thing about uh, selecting a five minute duration is that if you watch any video on TV or movie now, go do this next time you, do, you watch a movie or a video. Uh, count from one to five, do 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. No clip is more than five seconds. Um, if it's longer than five seconds, it's usually the camera is doing a pan or something. So somebody told me that uh, the duration of a clip, um, it corresponds to the time that your eye can blink or something like that. I just thought that was interesting. But from, from talking to video editors and looking at storytelling, we know that good videos, good stories, have short clips. But uh, the other thing that happened when we ran, when they were doing this, is that they still don't know if the highlights that the um, AI generated was actually any good, right? So then if they were to make this happen, they would have to have an experience where the user would have to tell them what's good or what's bad. Um, so this is a screen from, um, just from the new um, software, but basically what it's doing is that it's showing you telemetry data, like speed and elevation. Uh, and this is what it actually looks like for real. This is a meeting with the advanced tech team and you see the peaks in the interest graph. So this is the UX project uh, that I worked on. And the question we ask is, how might we make storytelling quick, easy, and fun? And if you look at uh, video editing software today, like Adobe Premiere or even iMovie, um, every single video editing software focus on is time. All you're doing is calculating time. And you're always doing the math in your head. You're like, like this clip is three seconds, the music is this long, and you're always trying to sync them up, right? Sorry. Like. Okay. Um, and then the other thing is that it's really, really hard to use those software. It's like people, it, the, there's overwhelming features because the softwares are, the, are basically built to make full movies or, you know, like commercials, like really professional products. And the average user don't need all those features. And even if they did know how to use the software, they still don't know what makes a good story. So this is a team, this is just our team to, that built this uh, Wizard of Oz prototype. Just me, a researcher, product manager, and a prototyper. Okay, I'm gonna skip that, just get to this. Okay, so our premise was that, um, how do we eliminate the user's uh, need to calculate time, to do math in the head? How do we just automatically make that happen? So if you look at any video, video editing software, it's always about timeline, right? You can infinitely create a movie, you know, like hours long if you want. Um, and you're always tuning that timeline. So our premise is that what if, what if music is the timeline? So music is the current that carries the story, and we're going to make the story emotional. So the idea we had was that if, what if we gave the user a template, which is the music, a smart piece of music. And in the music, it's tagged, like we can identify the emotional points in the music and the cuts in the music. And it's tagged. And then what happens is that when the user drops the clips into the um, timeline with this smart music template, it would automatically snap to these emotional points in the timeline, in the music timeline. 
and it would automate cut and you know compress each clip to make it emotional automatically magically so this is what I'm going to show you today is a prototype it is a wizard of oz prototype it's a it's like version 45 but this is the end we we went through like I don't know multiple versions but this is how it really actually works so I'm scrubbing all the videos I've captured all I need to do is to tap when I find something interesting and it automatically drops it down here you see the blue line down in the music template that's the point the emotional point in the music I tap on something again it drops down there it always fills it up so I'm just Tapping, tapping, tapping. And I think there's one more. And I can reorder it. And then that's it. This is actually a real user's uh, footage. He, he goes scuba diving at night. Can't really hear the music, but that's basically how it works. And then what happens if I decide that I don't like that piece of music, I can go and select other tracks. And when I select other tracks, it recuts the video to match to that piece of music, right? The reason why we had this on this side and, and so that the user can preview it like this is because when we did research, we realized that uh, filtering and figuring out moods and all that was unimportant is that as soon as the user discovers the music that they want to match their mood, it only takes them two seconds to figure out if that was the mood they wanted. So sampling was a pervasive behavior in, the, uh, in, in doing that research. OK, so uh, that's, that's the prototype. This is the real product, what it looked like afterwards. Um, I'm going to show you this video of, um, this is like the first version of the prototype. And what we did was we asked users to describe what a highlight means. So we did two different versions. One is the regular so trim model. It's a lot model. easier than just like starting the beginning and end. Um, and I think it makes editing much, much faster. So that was act, actually came from our research video, and we always build two different versions to test against each other. So one is the baseline of how people would have to trim, selecting the beginning and end points of a clip and to build their story. And the second one is they just basically scrub, tap, scrub, and tap. Um, so every single experiment we run has two diverging behaviors. So from, from that work, we're able to define uh, the roadmap for AI for music syncing. I'm not going to go through all this now, but basically um, we can roadmap out what, what we do first in terms of figuring out um, how to build music templates that are smart. So this is the money slide in this whole deck. Um, what we realize is that when people, when you give people a tool they have complete control over, right? especially a creative tool, um, the more time they spend on, you know, on, the, on the tool and to build a video, uh, they're going to get the more value they're going to get, the better their video is going to get. But it takes them a long time to get to something good. If you give them something that's machine assisted, the machine's only going to do something just good enough. It's never going to get any better than that, but they can get to satisfaction much quicker. So. Um, so the point of view we have is that we're not trying to duplicate iMovie or Premiere. We're just trying to give people something good enough so they can get something out to social media and share it, right? So that provided the guiding principles for the product. The other important thing that uh, came out of this project was that it's the information architecture of time. Um, so when you saw how people were selecting the moment in time, but we realized that if we can get people to select the highlight in their video, we can do multiple things with that highlight. If you can tell me that that point in time in your video was something important, I can slow-mo it, I can apply all these effects to it, and I can automatically create 
um, many different other moments for you. Now, realize that this research was done in 2015 before, um, before Google Photos came out. So um, we had already kind of thought of that, but we didn't get, couldn't get there soon enough. The other thing I always emphasize is that whatever action that you get the user to take, um, it's actually a receptor that sends information to teach the UI. So if you, you can get users to tell you that's an important moment, then you can feed that information back into the AI and then teach it like what is the, what is the good moment. Um, so interaction design for me means that designing receptors for AI. So everything you design that you get users to focus on, you could basically get more value out of it by teaching AI. So here's the last story. I promise this one will be short. So I did this work before I left GoPro, and I couldn't finish it. But, it, uh, but I was very proud of it because it earned me like a couple of patents. Uh, so the idea behind this project, I started with a conversation that my product manager and I had. Um, at the time, GoPro had started to build prototypes for 360 cameras. And I, I was thinking, like, what, what does storytelling for 360 look like? And my product manager says, you can only understand 360 video if you're a chicken. And the idea is that chickens have, you know, like prey have eyes on both sides. So they have close to a 360 vision, but we don't, we don't have that awareness, right? So if we need awareness, we have to build UI. Like when you drive a car, you want to see something in the back, you need UI, right? Um, so these are the cameras at the time. The, the first two cameras that came out, these aren't real cameras, they're more like rigs. And what they do is they, they put all these cameras together, and then you, they, you have to run it through its software, and it stitches it together. Uh, when I was working on it, we had a Fusion prototype that looked like you know, it's hacked. The real camera is over here, which to me is still a hack. But, um, but at the time, like, this is what we had to play with. So for you to understand the complexity around 360 video is that it's basically multiple cameras you're stitching it together. And uh, if you ever take photos of a room, this, this right side over here is very bright, this side over here is very dark, and if you stitch them together, they, look, they don't look like they, they connect, right? And then if you have two people, sometimes things are lying, get warped. So there's a lot of um, uh, technology, AI technology, that uh, kind of takes all the information and kind of like makes sure that they look seamless. Um, so, so that whole thing is it's a complex, uh, you know, a, it's really, really complex and um, takes a lot of processing time, which impacts the UX. So the question we had was that, how does the user engage with that 360 content and identify the best moments? Four, five. So this is an experiment that I ran when I went to Paris to meet with the Paris team. And we did that because we wanted to see how long it would take, uh, uh, how long is the video, and how long it would take for processing time. This is our inspiration, actually. This is a picture of, uh, of um, James Cameron uh, making Avatar. And he had this device where he just like films the thing by holding this tablet, right? Um, so we, we thought about doing that, doing, making our experience similarly. So this is the prototype. Um, we didn't have, you know, we didn't have a lot of time. We were trying to hack the thing. So we were using our old prototype that you saw on the previous, uh, on the pre previous project. And then we hooked up uh, you know, the uh, iPhone to the desktop. So we were using the iPhone as a, way, as a UI to kind of look at this 360 video. And then we had two different prototypes running. One is we give the user the ability to recapture, like a cinematographer, these, you know, the 360 video that they get to relive. And the other one is they, they're still doing the same thing, but all they are doing is tapping, and then the, uh, the software would cut the, the, you know, the, they would cut the video as a 2D clip and then place it into the, uh, the video editing software. And you can see a little bit here. Let me do this. Crap. 
There we go. So I'm just going to show you how it works. You can drop it down to your storyboard from your phone. I think that's a lot easier than maybe just even just scrolling through. You can kind of watch your whole video and then just drop it down. And then you go to here, you can kind of see how they're doing inside the, the For lab. Me, it was, you could almost re, like kind of like live the moment. So like walking through the crowd, you're living the moment and you're like, boom, okay. I'm walking this way with the camera and then I just want to pan out here. You can kind of see how that prototype worked. That was our ugly uh, Wizard of Oz prototype. And we did it just to see how people would interact and live, you know, relive the moment with their 360 video. Um, and what we found out is that they have more reshooting opportunities. There's more perspective, more panning, more moments. And the other thing we found out is that when people uh, get to relive the moments and then holding the iPhone like that, they automatically project themselves as a filmmaker. They were doing things that they didn't do otherwise. They were like thinking about panning, they were thinking about zooming, all these things they hadn't considered before. Um, the other thing that was, uh, that was different was that the clips were longer. Because before they just had like this one perspective, but if you can zoom in and transition, then it's a slow transition, and so the clips were longer. So what, what was happening was that when you set the 360 camera and it's doing the capturing for you, what you're doing afterwards is you're reliving the moment. And this really impacted the, the hardware team, how they, how they look at um, augmenting the camera at the time. Because they realized that what users were doing were they, they were kind of retelling the story afterwards. And so what was important is to have high resolution and a different kind of lens. So the research we did impacted the hardware design of the camera as well. Um, another thing that was interesting was that uh, we could invent time. So if you had a 360 still, you can kind of pan through a still and create bullet time. So there are things that were, you know, that were outputs of this that we hadn't considered that were possible to make novel uh, outputs for storytelling. And then the thinking around the highlight also changed. So before we were only looking at time. You know, like if you scroll through a video, you knew that at that point in time, that moment was interesting. But with the 360, you had to consider time, zoom, and angle, right? So it felt like we were kind of designing or deconstructing the matrix. And this was the design that I worked on afterwards. And um, on the third screen here, you see what we call quick stitch or six stitch. So we were giving the user the option if they wanted to have a low resolution stitching so they can get to something, the processing would be faster, or they can get something more high, uh, more high quality. And I didn't do this because I believe it was the right thing to do. I did it because I knew it was leaving GoPro and I, need, I knew the team needed to answer that question. So I knew that that was necessary, so I designed it that way. So in conclusion, uh, I want to say that uh, new experiences always change users' behavior. And when we as designers think about design, we, we like to envision the future, right? But what happens, I was talking to Dave about this last night, it's like designers like to envision the future, but they like to envision the future without constraints. <laughs> and I'm here to tell you that in the future, there still be constraints. But, but you get to set the focus. You don't, get, you don't have to wait for people to tell you what the constraint is. If you frame the experience right, you set the focus for the constraint. And the most important thing that I learned from this was that Wizard of Oz prototyping builds teams. So before I left GoPro, I had a director of engineering who came up to me uh, at the time because I had um, trained another team to kind of run this research, this process we had. And he said, you know, Ha, you think your value is your ideas, but that's not your value. Your value is the energy that you put behind the ideas. And every single time you run these things, you, auto you automatically build teams. So I think that that's the true value of Wizard of Oz prototyping. Uh, thank you.